This week, we're going to talk about fasting. And um, I got a little challenge. I call it the Taco Bell Challenge. Um, what we're going to do this week, we're going to deal with the topic of charismatic voodoo. That's um, pretty big in the body of Christ today. And we're going to really just crack it right in the head with a big 2 by 4 If you really begin to read the scriptures, you realize that in the New Testament, you're not going to find a single commandment to fast. Not a single commandment. Now, why is it that we have this big, massive infrastructure of fasting ministries all across the body of Christ with all the big hyperlinks, all the big who's who guys endorsing them? You're going to have a hard time finding one scripture in the New Testament. Now, some people will say, well, didn't Jesus say when he was casting out demons, that this one only comes out by prayer and fasting. Well, that's Matthew 17, verse 21. I'm going to look it up here in my NIV translation. Matthew 17, verse 21. Oh, wow, isn't that something? It doesn't even exist in there. It goes straight from verse 20 to 22. Maybe it's a bad translation. Maybe it's a corrupt translation. Well, I have a big stack of other translations that we can go through right here. If we look in our New Living Translation, there's no Matthew 17, verse 21. If we look in the Contemporary English Version, no Matthew 17, verse 21. If we look in the International Standard Version, now this one makes a boast, the most accurate English translation ever produced. Wow, I think they all say that, don't they? But nevertheless, no Matthew 17, verse 21. Uh, we look at a Catholic Bible here. You know, Catholics like to throw a bunch of extra stuff in there. They got their Deuterocanonicals, their Apocrypha. Surely they could at least throw Matthew 17, verse 21 in there. But this Good News Bible does not have Matthew 17, 21. I checked it myself. This one looks like a pretty big, thick, intimidating Bible. The Oxford Study Bible. Oxford, that sounds pretty smart, doesn't it? Look up. Matthew 17, 21 doesn't exist. If you look at Jesus' other conversation where he says the exact same thing in the book of, I believe it's in the book of Mark, he just says this one comes out by prayer. Fasting's not in there. Now, I don't believe in scribal errors. I'm not trying to tweak with your uh, infallibility of scripture. Why is that verse in some translations and not in others? Well, the oldest manuscripts don't even have that verse. If you want that verse to belong in the Bible, that's totally fine, but you better truly define what real fasting is. Real fasting has nothing to do with your McDonald's, has nothing to do with your Whopper Jr. True fasting has everything to do with the issues of the heart. Even in the Old Testament, the Lord gave us a better fast, which has nothing to do with your Big Mac. It has everything to do with reaching out to the poor, um, uh, generosity. It's an, it's an internal issue of the heart. Even in the Old Testament... God did not allow his people to uh, be overly ascetic. He didn't allow them to fast and beat down their physical bodies in order to gain spiritual benefit like the pagans did. That's Gnosticism. That's not Christianity. You don't, you don't get extra brownie points by beating up your physical body. That doesn't make you more spiritual. In the Old Testament, you only had one fast a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement, which represented the day that Christ would die, shakabonki, and that day of fasting turned into the greatest feast of all. 1 Corinthians tells us to keep the feast. The Bible never tells us to keep the fast. So some people would say, well, what about the bridal fast? Didn't Jesus say that when he's taken away from us that we would fast? Well, if you look in the scriptures, you know, the Pharisees were coming up to Jesus. It actually says here in the New Living Translation and uh, Luke chapter 5, it says their next complaint, verse 33, was that Jesus' disciples were feasting instead of fasting. John the Baptist's disciples are constantly going without food and praying, they declared, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples whining and dining? <laughs> Jesus asked, do happy men fast? If you're fasting for joy, I'd encourage you to give up. Do wedding guests go hungry while celebrating with the groom? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. This says killed. Then they won't want to eat. Would you want to eat if your buddy got killed? 
The Bible says on that day they will fast. How long did that day last? It lasted at most 40 hours. The early church had a 40-hour fast in order to recognize the time that Jesus was taken into the grave. They, they never had a 40-day fast. They had a 40-hour fast. They didn't fast once a week. They had a 40-hour fast one time a year just to remember the fast of Christ. It wasn't to gain any extra benefit, any extra spiritual points. Uh, Adam Clark, the Bible translator, he said, 40-day fast of Lent, he said, is uh, pretended to be kept by many in the present day in commemoration of our Lord's 40-day fast in the wilderness, but it does not appear that the purest ages of the primitive church, that genuine Christians, ever pretended that their fast was kept for the above purpose. Their fast was kept merely to commemorate the time which Jesus lay under the power of death, which was about 40 hours, writes Clark. Adding that over the year, over the years, this 40-hour fast morphed into a 40-day fast. And, and he said they put days in place of hours, and this absurdity continues in some Christian churches to the present day. Well, indeed it does. Indeed, this absurdity does. People think they're gaining extra points, that they're somehow getting closer to God. Listen, fasting is not going to get you any closer to God. It's not going to get you any brownie points. It's not going to, you know, the, the early disciples, the apostles never fasted in order to somehow draw closer to the Lord or to end abortion or anything like that. The only time they ever fasted was, was just to make decisions, to clear their heads so they could appoint like an elder or a leader in the church. And, and that didn't even always work. You remember that they prayed and they fasted in order to try to get an, a, a replacement for Judas. So they picked Matthias. It said they prayed, they fasted, finally they gave up, they rolled the dice. <laughs> and you remember all the books written about Matthias. Oh, there aren't any. <laughs> God bless you, Matthias, if you're listening. But how many guys know that God had his own pick? He had his own choice up his sleeve. It was the Apostle Paul. Galatians 1.1, he said, I am an apostle not appointed by man, but appointed by God. There are not 13 thrones in heaven. It talks about 12 thrones that the apostles sit on, the original apostles sit on. So anyways, shakabonky. Jesus, when he talks about the bridal fast, he says, how can they fast when the bridegroom is with them? In that day, they will fast. On that day, that day lasted, that was the day he died. You would not want to eat if your best buddy got killed. But now, how many of you know that the bridegroom is closer to you than he was to Matthew, Mark, and John? He was walking together with those guys, but now he's walking inside of you. He's not just walking with you like he did with Adam in the cool of the day. You're closer to him than Adam was. He's living inside of you, okay? So listen, the bridegroom is here. It's time that we stop trying to add on to what Christ has done. Every time we, we try to add something on, we're spitting on the finished work of the cross. We're saying that your sacrifice, your blood was not enough to bring me into complete reconciliation and to draw me as close to God as I possibly could be. You are plugged into him. You are Siamese twins with Jesus. You are in union, uninterrupted union with God. Fasting doesn't bring you closer to God. And you got a lot of young people that are all caught up in this stuff, banging their head against the wall, people drumming up all these young people to try to reaccomplish something that Jesus has already done, like a dog chasing his tail, trying to purify themselves when he's already cleaned you up. In reality, these people, instead of taping their mouths up, they could be going out and preaching the gospel of grace. If you enjoy fasting, just to clear your head or you're, you're trying to get some direction on something and help you focus, that's, that's fine. You go enjoy your fasting. But if you're doing it to try to get brownie points, to try to earn something um, from God, or to become more spiritual, that's that's uh, that's pretty naughty. And so I'd encourage you not to do that because you can't mix your grace with a little bit of self-effort, all right? Uh, grace plus law equals law. It's an algebraic formula. Paul says that you add anything to grace and you've alienated yourself from grace. So I'd encourage you, if you like to fast, that's fine. But the problem comes in when you're trying to force yourself to uh, somehow obtain some spiritual benefit as if you don't already have it. You've received everything in Christ. I'm actually fasting right now. I'm fasting depression, demons, poverty, religion, 
Did you know all of these fasts are a billion times better than a food fast? I exaggerate not. God cares about the issues of your heart. He doesn't give a rip about what you're eating. If you want to fast, why not have a supernatural fast? Like uh, Teresa Newman, she died in the 1960s. This is not legend. This is not fairy tale. This lady was well observed by medical researchers and by the church. She had a supernatural fast where she fasted for 40 years, no food. 35 of those years, no water. Imagine no water for 35 years. That's supernatural. Catherine of Siena also had a supernatural fast for eight years. No food and water. The thing about Teresa, all she had one time a day, she had a little tiny piece of a communion wafer. She couldn't even eat the whole thing unless she was in an ecstasy. Then she'd eat the whole wafer. That's all she had. And she was a plump lady. <laughs> the thing is, she was not trying to force herself. She just didn't want to eat. If she smelled food in the house, she just she dry heave. She didn't want to eat. You see, the the, the issue is trying to force ourselves with human willpower to climb into heaven to get more of the Holy Spirit. That's divination, guys. That's witchcraft. You get Holy Spirit not because of your prayer, not because of your fasting, not even because of your waiting and your tarrying. Holy Spirit is a G I F T. It's all about grace. It's honoring His sacrifice and saying that what you did was enough. It all flows from Emmanuel's veins. Don't separate your cow from your Pentecost. You're not getting one ounce more of the Holy Spirit by beating up your physical body. This is the voodoo that the early church fell into in Colossae. This is what Paul said in Colossians chapter 2. He said, in view of these tremendous facts, don't let anyone worry you by criticizing what you eat or drink or what, what holy days you ought to observe or the new moons or Sabbaths or fill in the blank, whatever the charismatic trend is of the day that's supposed to make you, you know, a little bit better, you know, a little bit more anointed, a little bit more spiritual than your neighbor, okay? It says, all all these things have at most only a symbolical value. The solid fact is Christ. Nor let any man cheat you of your joy in Christ. Nobody would do that, right? Cheat me of my joy in Christ? Especially not a Christian, right? <laughs> By persuading you to make yourselves, quote, humble and fall down and worship angels. Now, some people say this passage is, you know, telling us, be careful, don't talk about angels, we'll worship angels. This, you're more prone to worship Britney Spears than you are an angel, all right? Your problem and your Greco-rationalistic mind is more to disbelieve they exist today, okay? This passage is not about angel worship. It's about bad, charismatic speakers trying to pull people into doo-doo works, okay? It says, such a man inflated by an unspiritual imagination is pushing his way into matters he knows nothing about and in his cleverness forgetting the head. There's lots of people that will go around the boast in all their 40-day fasts. The fact that you can think of a minister right now who's done a 40-day fast should show you that their 40-day fast doesn't count. But the very fact that they brought it up and had to boast about it means that it was invalidated, okay? So you shouldn't think so highly about them, all right? Uh, the thing is, guys, don't be intimidated. Don't be bamboozled. Don't be hoodwinked by people who are boasting in their asceticism, okay? This is the same problem the Apostle Paul had in his day, okay? Uh, the people mesmerizing them with some miracles that they could do and with their, their ability to beat themselves up, okay? I love miracles, but I'm, I'm boasting in Jesus, okay? Shaka bonky. He says... So if through your faith in Christ you are dead to the principles of this world's life, why, as if you were still part and parcel of this worldwide system, do you even take the slightest notice of these purely human prohibitions? Don't touch this. Don't taste that. Don't handle the other. This, that, and the other will all pass away after use. I know that these regulations look wise, with their self-inspired efforts at worship or will worship or willpower worship, forcing yourself uh, to somehow do something to get closer to God, a God-pleasing uh, thing. You, 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 we don't need to be delivered so much from a man-pleasing spirit as we need to be delivered from our God-pleasing. God is already pleased with you. He's only pleased for one reason and one reason only. It's because of the sacrifice of His Son. There's nothing you can do to add to that. Again, your attempt to add to that is the very thing that can alienate you from grace. It says their policy of self-humbling and their studied neglect of the body. Don't be mesmerized by the studied neglect of the body. But in actual practice, they do honor not to God, but to man's own pride. Shaka bonky. So I have a standing challenge. Uh, anybody who wants to go do a 40-day fast, you go fast for 40 days. And meanwhile, I'm going to eat a grilled stuffed chicken burrito for those 40 days. And then we'll see who can pop out the most miracles. All right? 
Now that sounds arrogant to you. Well, I'm not boasting in what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just eating a burrito. I'm boasting in the finished works of Christ. You can boast in your effort. You can boast in your voodoo, your doo-doo. I'm boasting in him. God bless you. Go eat a Big Mac.